Well, welcome back. I am delighted to have this conversation in my studio. Well, Meryl and mine, actually. It's upstairs in our home, and the books, and Steve Ken just made these shelves for us. And it's such a warm space. It's such a happy space for me. And when Tyler came around to do some videoing today, I thought, no, I want to do it up here again. It's, it's, it's very fun uh, for me. So what we're going to do today is a little different in that we've had a number of questions uh, sent to us about Genesis Collective. And we don't really have one space that we can point people to to say, okay, that's what will help you understand both the mind and the heart of what drives the collective. So I'm going to take about 20 minutes, answer some questions. We won't answer them all, but I think it will help nevertheless. Let me read a passage of scripture or two first. Hebrews 3, therefore, because of everything else that's been said, holy brothers and sisters, we share in this heavenly calling. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. That's what this is all about. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. The whole apest conversation, we must always remember, is about Jesus. What he started, he will finish. He said that even greater things that he did, we will do also. It says, he was faithful to the one who appointed him. Just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. Just as the builder of the house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. So here the writer of Hebrews, whoever they may be, brings Jesus and his ministry into the context of building something. You know, it's so easy certainly here in South, Southern California, to create something that's a blessing. Just one-off events, uh, one-off high points, and uh, I'm not so sure that is of paramount importance to our Heavenly Father. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, the same idea. Lord Almighty, my soul yearns even faints for the courts of the Lord. Remember, that's where the church started. House to house and temple courts. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home. And the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar. We want to be close to you. We want to be tucked in to you. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now, I could carry on reading that. You know the text, I know the text, and we love the text. But I want to remind us that our task is to build. We are builders. Paul speaks about himself as a master builder. And so, what are some of the questions that we get quite often? Firstly, what is Genesis Collective? Now, do you mind if I give you two definitions? The first is common language. Just what do we think about when we think about Genesis? Well, it's a group of friends who are passionate about three things. One, taking the gospel to the four corners of the globe. I think about that every day. 7.3 billion people on the planet. Oh, my word. Ever increasingly we find more and more people just do not know the precious name of Jesus and the redemption that comes with it. And what a privilege to collaborate together to see that happen. Secondly, it's planting strong, healthy, multiplying local churches. Strong, healthy, multiplying churches or communities. Isn't that what what, 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 what we're passionate about. Don't we love the, the photo album of healthy churches, doing community, strong in theology, on mission together, leaders coming through, multiplying themselves. Oh my word, I, I get incredibly excited by that. And then thirdly, helping to train and coach and equip all the priesthood on their great global assignments. That's what we love doing. That's what we are on about. But in more technical language, we're an apostolic prophetic movement committed to global church planting and leadership mobilization. 
So we want to increase lead the, the leader piece in every believer uh, in the churches that we work with. We want to plant churches, uh, whether they are dining room table communities or strong pulpit center churches. It doesn't really matter what the architecture is like. We just want to see those churches that are strong and robust for Jesus. And then, of course, we want to multiply movements. <coughs> we don't just want one movement, one brand to go, and then one day we get to a place where we hand it over to one other person. That's kind of papal, denominational. That's, to us, not biblical. The picture of Jesus taking his 12, pouring his life into them. Judas fell uh, by the by. The disciples replaced him. And uh, all of these beautiful global movements emerged in the years after his crucifixion and then resurrection and ascension. It's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing, actually. Now let's pause for just a moment on the moment versus movement conversation. I think that God has called us to build a movement that is multi-generational. For me, that's what excites me, to think that those of us who are boomers, who may have 20 years left of ministry, to Paul, to Timothy, to faithful men, to others also, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the boys. Do you get it? It's this four-generational reality that the movement offers. Moments are okay. Those high points. But notice when Peter, in Acts chapter 2, has a moment. It says, Peter with the eleven stood up and he preached. A high moment. The Holy Spirit has come. They preached. Three thousand were added to their number. But then the latter part of the chapter is all movemental language. It's, this is what the movement looked like. This is what they did, how they lived, how they gave themselves away. And that is what we desire to do. We're a group of friends or an apostolic prophetic movement. Both reflect who we are and what we are. The second big question is the third space. Now, when we were exploring what was kind of pulsing in our heart, obviously we went to Jesus saying, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost. Well, Jerusalem is my local church in my city. Judea, Samaria is surrounding area, similar culture, surrounding area, different culture. That's the second space. And the third space is the uttermost, where Jesus is not known or where he has been neglected, forgotten, or ignored. Europe falls into the latter category, and parts of India and China fall into the former category. Great examples of what that third space looks like. So what is our role as um, uh, the, the, the collective in those three spaces? Number one, God speaks in Ephesians 2.20 that apostles and prophets lay foundations. So by invitation, we'll talk about that in a moment, it is our privilege to come into churches and lay a solid foundation, not the leaning tower of Pisa, a solid foundation that can be generationally significant. I was um, chatting to Stan. Stan is the fourth leader in Glenridge, the church Merrill and I and a group of friends planted way back in 1983. And uh, whatever the number is now, it's almost uh, 38 years, I think. Four leaders. It's strong. It's healthy. It's multiplying. So proud of those guys. That's the idea that we want to build around. So there is an invitation for the apostolic prophetic role in local churches in laying foundations. But obviously, we can't speak to and on behalf of every local church and what they do in their city. Matt Larson up in Thousand Oaks, Terry Fouchet up in Pasadena, Josh Lewis in Denver, Justin and crew in Orlando, uh, never mind uh, Dave and Katie in Nicaragua, and so I can go on. It's not possible for the Ephesians 4 gifts to be able to be authorities on what every church needs to do in their city. We can offer wisdom and perspective, but it's really for those elders to wrestle that through um, and decide what God has them do in their local city. In terms of surrounding area, similar or different culture, again, I don't think it's necessarily what um, 
the APES gifts are there for. We can help, we can give perspective, but at the end of the day, where we are uh, in our sweet spot or purple patch is when we are in the nations of the world. Matt Larson said when we were exploring Genesis Collective, I said, Matt, why would we even want to do this? He said, because we're better together than we are apart. And so our strongest thrust is the nations of the world. But we do have biblical privilege and mandate in those other two spaces. Apostolic foundations, I touched on it earlier, but let me say the investment and the invitation for apostles and prophets into a local church is exactly that. It's not imposition. It's by the local elders, plural, not one man, the local elders, plural, inviting apostles and prophets and the other gifts to come in and help initially lay foundations and then any ongoing perspective that might be needed. There are four occasions which we've touched on before when we need our foundation work. The first is obvious, when a church is new. The second, when there's an increased profile in the city. The church gains new profile, perspective, um, recognition. And it's a good time to just see, can our foundations cope with this increasing profile? Or if there's a sudden growth, suddenly we've got tens or fifties or a hundred uh, new people just coming in regularly. I remember leading Glenridge and we battled to break through probably 250 or so. And one day, we didn't do anything differently. We had a, a guy come and teach in the middle of his talk. He stopped and he said, you used to grow in 10s and 20s, but you are now going to grow in 50s and 100s. Boy, did we love that prophetic word. Instantly it was, yes, that's what it was. And for years after that, every orientation course was 50 plus, 100 plus. It was a remarkable moment. So it's new church, increased profile, increased growth, or fourthly, tragically, when there's been a fracture, when the eldership team is divided, when there's been a moral failure or financial impropriety, or someone has sown some really bad seed in the church. That's the time to bring the apostle prophet back in to help rework those foundations. Now, most of you listening to this will be asking in the light of you, how does this affect you if you feel like, yep, this is what God has called you to be and to do? Well, here are some of my thoughts. Firstly, Jesus had 12 disciples that he poured himself into. Now, I understand the Old Testament context to that, but I think there is something really valuable. Some of us have come out of an apostolic story where the uh, APES team just got bigger and bigger and bigger. That is not our dream. Um, I'm not sure that's what the Lord requires of us. I think a tight-knit team, highly mobile and available team of somewhere between 7, 8, 9 till 12 is a really good working model. I watched Terry Virgo use that for years with New Frontiers, and it was a, a highly effective approach. We see similarly that with Paul and Peter, they didn't have a set team by the letters that were written and the people that were greeting them and those who traveled with them. There seemed to be a lot more fluidity. Um, and so we are saying we recognize some of the Ephesians for gifting in you. And we want to train you up. We want to ready you. And we want to use you in spaces and places where your gifting is most effective. If you are effective in Africa, do Africa. If you're effective in Asia, do Asia. We don't want to just send people hither and thither. Um, a great personal time and resource expense when actually you are very specifically gifted and called by God to a particular people or a particular region. We are very protective about family. Um, again, by the grace of God, the previous movement that we were part of, I was thinking the other day, I think... Um, 25 years I was in the movement, I think we lost three marriages, I speak under correction, and all three cases, there were strong warnings given, you're traveling too much, you're traveling too much without your wife, and, uh, well, it didn't end well. Now, we similarly are very protective about your family, your marriage, your kiddos, and we'll factor that into the equation, of course we love working and doing this with our spouses. Of course, we love 
traveling together. I think it helped so much. The whole Ravi Zacharias thing recently threw all of us, didn't it? It did me. I didn't even want to read all the documents and find out everything he was supposed to have done wrong. It just broke my heart. But most of his travel was by himself. And I think there are ways in which we can prevent that. One, traveling with our wives or husbands uh, as often as possible. Two, never traveling alone if possible. Unless you're flying somewhere and you're joining uh, a with the context in which you are familiar. Three, that you are accountable. Um, if you're not part of the, the 9, 10, 11, 12 of us, but that there are two or three people who are speaking into your life. Um, I, I sometimes, especially when we're young, I did it, so, so I'm not being judgy, but, but uh, the, the appeal of travel and the appeal of getting into different nations and different cities and to different spaces can be Wow, can, can draw us. But I do want to warn us. Let's have people who can speak into it. Sometimes our elders aren't the best um, to be kind of the reference points because they are doing what God's called them to be, to be shepherds, pastors, overseers of the local flock, and to be exclusively accountable to them at a translocal space hmm, is not always the best. So my suggestion would be, uh, get one or two of the guys who are on the collective leadership and maybe one or two people you can love and trust who will speak honestly to you, whose salaries aren't dependent on you, um, and just have regular kind of touching base with. Uh, I love doing that with Terry. He's a dear friend from 1981, and we ask each other very honest questions, and I actually really like that, that there is accountability uh, and then, of course, just remember, we really are here to build. We're not here to just bless people having lots of events. We are building um, a, a, a significant apostolic movement that will multiply into 8 to 12 movements within 12, 15 years, of course. Now, what is the role of APEST in a local church? Let me summarize quickly. It's by invitation, not imposition. We'll never impose. I have got friends that, that are very comfortable impositionally. They go into the churches. They can ask a whole eldership team to step down. They can bring um, a new leader in. I don't know, man. I think it's dangerous. You can, you can point to a few proof texts, of course. I'm not persuaded it's the best way. Maybe it's a weakness. I don't know. So it's by invitation. Secondly, it's through relationship and gift recognition. In other words, I recognize the apostolic mantle that's on your life. Paul said amazingly, to some, I'm an apostle. And you think, really? Surely everyone recognized him as such. Nope, it didn't happen that way. Thirdly, biblically, I think the elders and the apostle relationship is an integrated one. What do I mean by that? Biblically, there wasn't the lead pastor who was a category above all the other elders. Eldership was plural, Acts 19, 1 Peter 5. It was the plurality, and therefore I think it's really helpful if the apostles have access to the eldership team and they in turn to them. One of the biggest mistakes I made with the church that many of you know is that my friendship with the lead guy was so deep and so real that I had very limited contact with the other uh, elders. And when things did end up going a little pear-shaped, I realized it was my error. I, I should have been equally committed to connecting with the other elders to get more of a holistic view on how the church really was doing. I also want to add, we are not looking to conformity. There is no the model. Some of us are building around the dining room table. Others are building around the pulpit. Some are high and strong in worship. Others are very driven with local mission. And so I can go on. I, I think there's beauty and diversity. There's celebration in the creativity that it brings. So it's not our job to impose a singular theology, a singular ecclesiology, a singular missiology. It really is similar, definitely not the same uh, at all. And uh, of course, there are differences when we talk culturally. The context in which I'm ministering here in Southern California is not like a township in South Africa. It's not like um, a rural area of Macedonia. And so we embrace and accept some of that 
cultural diversity in the way in which the churches are built. Now, one of the questions that gets asked me is, can we and our church work with other Ephesians for giftings? Of course. Of course. Look at Paul in Corinth, and he says, he says uh, Paul, Cephas, and Apollos, they all minister into the church there. He's not protective. He's not being um, kind of uh, territorial. But he does offer up the issue of priority. And I think that's an important thing. I can have many relationships with many women, but there is a priority in marriage in which I give myself with privileges to Meryl and she with me. Now, in the same way, of course, you can have your Apollos. You can have your Cephas. You can have your Paul speak in there. But it is important, I think, to ensure that there is a priority relationship in which you give priority time, priority energy uh, to those who are walking together on this journey, this movement uh, of adventure. And uh, so we are not trying at, at all to kind of isolate people. Are you in or are you out? That's not our heart's desire by any stretch of the imagination. And of course, lastly, someone asked me about uh, money. Of course, you can imagine the reality of what it takes to be a global movement. Of course, there are finances. Uh, we haven't taken an offering for Genesis Collective in the four years we've been together. This is the first time I even answer that question. But it's wonderful if churches so into the collective because we are planning churches. As you know, we've got this gap here called Launch that we are starting. And uh, we are traveling and getting to the churches. And so I can go on. All of these things do cost. And when we look at the biblical picture, certainly Philippians chapter 4, there is this great privilege of investing in the partnership of the gospel between a local church and uh, apostolic prophetic crew. I hope this answers some of the questions for you. Um, each of these can be embellished upon, but I think it gives you a little more of a window of what this looks like. I land with this. My dream is that before I'm done, before I hand over leadership or pass away, that uh, we will have 8 to 12 apostolic movements that straddle the globe. I have asked the crew that Genesis Collective as a name and a brand is what God has given me under my watch. Just like Terry Virgo had New Frontiers International under his watch and what God had called him to build. And my dream is that 8 to 12 Different apostolic movements around the globe will be launched, firing on all cylinders by the time I'm done. And then I will be able to sit on my proverbial rocking chair as the sun sets and my hairline recedes and my belly gets bigger. And I'm able to enjoy these great days and say, surely the Lord has been so good to us. Genesis Collective, a window of maybe 15 years. But oh my word, look at Anthem. Look at Restored. Look at, look at, look at, and we will sit back and say, God has been so good to us. Hope that answers some of your questions. We'll chat soon. God bless you. Bye-bye now.